Okay, so welcome everybody to the first Snuggle Up with Spineless event. As you can see, I've dressed the part. My name is Callan from Mini Digi Marketing and I'll be emceeing tonight's event. Snuggle Up with Spineless are a series of online events kindly put on by the Spineless Wonders team to bring to the attention of lovers of Australian short story, some interesting new books for your shelf and authors for your following list. So we don't need to leave the cuddly comfort of the couch, a blanket and a cup of tea to be brought some fantastic new reads. Today, we have an interview with the author of not just one, but a whole collection of these short stories, Larry Boyd, a gifted storyteller with a wry original view. Larry Boyd is equally at ease in the world of 12th century China or the hip hop community. His wonderfully diverse stories are full of sly humor and unexpected twists. There's the tragedy of a daughter of a Polish migrant navigating Australian Christmas at its ugliest, the misadventure of a servant in feudal Japan, and even an ironic take on fishy tales. Boyd gets inside his characters, a child fantasizing to escape feuding parents, a father struggling with his role as his baby son's primary carer, a teenage music student inspired by his first sexual experience. This is storytelling at its traditional best. So that enthusiastic review is from the back of Larry's book, Little Matsue and Other Tales, reviewed by our wonderful interviewer tonight, Sally Blakeney. Little Matsue and Other Tales was just released as an audiobook. So more details on where you can get your hands on a copy uh, and also some free giveaways will come later. Unfortunately, as part and parcel of the job, we won't get to find out about our lovely interviewer tonight. So let me briefly introduce Sally. Sally Blakeney is a journalist and freelance reviewer whose work has appeared in The Bulletin, The Australian and The Sydney Morning Herald. Another voice we'll be hearing from tonight, but sadly won't be. So if you can hear my dogs in the background, they are currently wrestling. Um, but so sadly, we won't be hearing from, we will be hearing from tonight, but Sally won't be joining us in person, is the voice actor who narrated the audiobook version, which has just been published, Mark Desai. Mark is an award-winning actor Australian in origin, but currently New York based. He has kindly provided us with a video to, uh, taking us into his home and showing his narration set up so we can get to know him. So let's take a look at that now. Hello, all you little fictioners and spineless wanderers. My name is Mark Desai and I am the audio narrator for Little Matsue and Other Tales by Larry Boyd. Uh, I'm welcoming you into my home here in Brooklyn, in New York, on a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, just to chat a little about my process and to show you my uh, setup here. Uh, so, we'll start with the babies, as you can see, all the little plant babies getting their morning dose of vitamin D. And they, they definitely live a very charmed life here. Uh, behind me, is the acting side of things, the film uh, self-tape area, and in here we have Le Boudoir, Les Bedroom. Uh, now, where I actually taped Little Matsue and uh, recorded Little Matsue and other tales is here in our guest loft. We have a little space that uh, Friends can come and stay in every now and again for a couple nights here and there. Um, and take the stairs up, which is not easy to do when you're holding a phone. Uh, so I will go close. Uh, we have currently have it set up for someone that's coming to stay. But uh, behind me is my little setup here. Uh, little blue Yeti mic, little stand, little arm, little pop filter, headphones. Um, so I'm able to kind of lock all the, close all this off and uh, ensconce myself in here um, and record these fabulous stories uh, that come my way from Spineless Wonders. A uh, little about my process, it's pretty straightforward. I, I don't do anything too elaborate. I, I, I like to warm up vocally in the shower, I like to stretch, I like to make sure everything's warmed up and, limbered and open and flexible uh, and then after breakfast I will just have a cup of tea or coffee and I will curl up in here and, and open up my laptop and read these wonderful stories which the way I kind of uh, think about it 
is as if you were sitting beside me and I was reading to you from a book. Um, that's how I hope my narration uh, comes across. That's, that's what I aim for. Um, these stories, Lil Matsue and other tales, were so wonderful to read. I had a, uh, they were a great joy to read. Really, very imaginative and evocative, and just so well written with a lot of humanity and and um, humor and joy. Uh, they were an absolute pleasure to read, and I hope you enjoy hearing them as much as I enjoyed reading them. Uh, so this is a snuggle up with. Uh, spineless. Um, my snuggle up routine is definitely uh, a glass of lovely red wine and some chocolate and a good book or a good nature documentary. Thank you to Mark for sending that in. Uh, and for tonight's event, the major portion is an interview with an experienced author and teacher of writing, Larry Boyd. Uh, there will be some audio extracts from his book shared with you. Um, before we get stuck into the interview, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are all zooming in from tonight. I am zooming in from Bidjigal land of the Darug Nation. Larry zooming in from Kamaraigal Kamar uh, country and Sally from Gadigal country. So we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. I also invite you all to put in the chat the land you are zooming in from as well. With all that said, please give a digital round of applause as we welcome to our virtual stage, the star of the night, Larry Boyd and interviewer, Sally Blakeney. So let me get my head out of the way so that I can put the... Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. And um, I'm I'm snuggled up tonight with my books all around me, um, and Hello. I'm wearing uglies. Was better to everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm very snuggled, and I am Zooming so pleased to be introducing you to Larry Boyd. To Larry is a writer living with Alert. a disability, and we've had an example of how Larry uses a voiceover to to deal with that. He's worked in the field of disability arts for 20 years, including as director of different degrees theatre ensemble, a disability theatre company. Prior to this, he's been a lawyer, teacher, arts administrator, youth worker, and an actor. Larry, I want to ask you, after listening to Mark saying he imagines that he's reading from a book to somebody when he's recording, who is your audience when you're writing? No, no, not the same process at all, Sally. I don't have an audience. I couldn't do that. I could not have other people in the room um, beside me, even in that little snug uh, that Mark has in New York. I don't write for a reader. I write because I get absorbed into the stories. I get absorbed into the situations. And I mean really absorbed. I have to be there with them because that's the only way I feel that I, as a writer, can get a veracity to what's going on. So in Little Matsue, I'm sitting there on the portico steps with him as that downpour happens. In Sostenuto, I'm beside Andrew at the piano as he fulminates against the what he considers to be an absurd um, composition assignment with um, Joe in the supermarket. I'm there when Bubbo tips the packet of eggs over the groceries. That's how I write, not for anyone outside, but to um, be there myself. And in doing that, clearly, somewhere down the line, someone might want to read this, but I never assumed that. So no, I, I, an act is different. An act is a performer. They perform on a stage, they either read from the stage or they're in character. So that's what Mark's talking about. A writer, this writer, sits in a room and goes into another world. 
I think that's a fascinating answer because it's actually one of the reasons we all read or listen to stories, isn't it? Because we want to travel to a different place. Um, and I think during the last couple of years, the big thing we've all been able to do is travel, even though we've been confined. And, and that's thanks to storytellers like, like Larry. Um, and it's, 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 it's a wonderful gift people who collect stories the way Larry has. And what's very noticeable in Little Matsui is how incredibly diverse uh, the stories are. So okay. one moment you're in ancient China, the next moment you're um, at a barbecue. Uh, you never know quite where you're going to end up. <laughs> so it's in a way, it's like being on a world tour where you don't know where you're actually going to end up. And it's very exciting, that kind of writing, because a lot of contemporary writing, particularly in short stories, it, there's a sameness to it. And that doesn't happen with Larry's writing. And, and Larry, you've taught writing and you've written plays and a novel. The, the writer, you know, Diaz says he loves short stories and writes them because it's like hanging around with my tribe. Why do you choose to write short stories when you can also write plays? Why, why write a short story? Oh, isn't that interesting? Um, I just read there as coming from, but I do not regard the characters in my stories as my tribe. My tribe's out here in real time and I love them. And I like to mix with them. Um, the, the thing about a sh the thing about writing for me, Sally, is that that is how I make sense of the world. You know, all of these experiences that I have and have had over a very long and active lifetime, I need to make some sense of it. I need to understand and clarify what it's all been about. And the way I do that is by writing. If I was a musician, I would compose. If I was a choreographer, I would choreograph dance. If I was an artist, I would paint it. But I don't, I write it. So the writing of long and short story, long, short stories and long fiction is, is for me, bliss. It's, it's a way of living. It's a way of occupying time and making sense of the world. Now, having said that, I want to caveat here because... The kinds of plays that I worked on, both in Melbourne with Fusion Theatre for 10 years and different degrees in Sydney for another 10 years, are not scripted plays in the traditional sense. What those projects are about is at the beginning of a year, meeting and greeting the cast, the new members or the old members, bringing them back in and saying, what are we going to do this year? And over the weeks, you talk about the issues in their lives. You talk about the things that interest them, the things they may have seen on the news, and you build and you workshop their ideas. And in building and workshopping their ideas, a narrative at some point emerges. You may have to push it with particular kinds of activities to get it over a hurdle. But then when it's at the stage where the narrative is really forming, I begin to jot it down. One, so I don't forget. Two, so that the uh, people working with me don't forget. And three, so that the um, members themselves, I can give it to them and those that read don't forget. As we get close to um, finishing the, the play, um, I then have to do things like I write a storyboard and everybody can see the storyboard. We put it on a wall so you can see this, this, and this. They get the sequences. The next thing that happens is I have to write um, cues for the text, sound cues and lighting cues. And when we go into the theatre for the dress rehearsal, I give those cues to the sound tech, I give those cues to the lighting tech, and we pull the whole thing together during the dress rehearsal. So it's a quite different process. It's collaborative theatre. But yeah. Larry, you've also written a novel. Is it is it more difficult to write a short story or a novel? Which which one which one is? I mean, it, 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 uh, theatre is collaborative, 
but you're on your own when you're writing a short story. Yeah. You're on your own when you're writing a novel. And they're two very different processes. Yeah. The novel, oh, so you ask me which is the more difficult. Just they, they're both, well, it depends where you are in your writing development, point one. As a new writer, writing a novel is so intimidating. You know, think how, how, what have I got to say and how am I going to get, how am I going to say it? Writing a short story doesn't have that length and brevity. Writing a short story is like a quantum and into that quantum, it's rather like poetry. You have to compress the meaning. So the words are terribly, terribly important in clarifying your intention. When you write a novel, you have much more liberty to develop, expose, nuance the characters and the situation, bring it to the crisis and then the denouement. Problem with a novel is that they're long. So, you know, you're going to take two years. And what you wrote on page 43, you're going to have to remember 18 months later when you're writing page 189. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they each have their difficulties. The one is the difficulty of compressing into a short number of words. Well, I think a short story is seven to 9,000 words, and a novel can be any length at all. And the problem with, say, telling of the South Song story is it is almost at the edge of a novella. It's quite a long story, whereas Little yeah. Matthew is absolutely a short story. Yeah, and and uh, and I read somewhere uh, a writer saying that um, when you write a novel, you could end up being a different person by the time you finish it because it takes so long to write a novel, whereas in the short story, you're that person in that moment that you're writing the short story. Do you do you think that makes sense in terms of your own experience? Or? Yeah. In terms of my own experience, it makes a sense. When I wrote Choice Boy, I started in 2018, then had 18 months of serious medical involvements, which totally torpedoed um, what I was writing. Then I had to come back to it, and it took another 18 months to complete it. But, yeah, no, it, it is a real issue about... Um, how you get from the beginning to the end and whether you change. Certainly the characters change. I mean, you hear writers saying this all the time, and it's absolutely true, because there is a bank in my head of memories, memories of experiences that I'm trying to make sense of. And as I write the novel, you sort of think, like, what are you doing? Why are you saying that? That's not you. That's not your character. Yeah. And you have to rethink what's happening there. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's rubbish and you delete it. You can't do that in a short story. You have can you keep, to can you, can you keep more control of the character in a, in a short story than you can in a novel? I mean, writers often talk about um, characters running away in a novel. Can you, can you sort of keep your, curb your writer, the characters yeah. or not? Yeah, that, in a short story, you have to control the character development, but you cannot go deeply into those characters because you don't have the space, don't have the room. In a novel, you can go very deeply into your characters and expose things on page 120 that is that's only suggested at page 43. So they're quite, quite different in those ways, the level of control. Level of control with a novel is being able to remember everything and map the development and keep it consistent that the characters, even though they're going to change 90 pages later, have to change consistently with what they've been before and with whatever it is that's making them change. In a novel, in a short story, I beg your pardon, you don't have that luxury. Yeah, and, and, and some some people think that writing a short story is easier than writing a novel, but it sounds just as difficult in its own terms. Is that true? No, I don't think so. It has difficulties. Of course it has difficulties. And you have to be very careful about how you shape it. The architecture is really important. I mean, architecture is important in a, in a novel, but in a short story, it's really, really important because, again, of those word count considerations. Um, but I, I think it is easier to write a short story. 
um, that it is to write a novel. Are there are short story writers that you particularly admire. Oh, Sally, Sally, I can't, I can't. I have macular degeneration. I cannot read the printed word. A lot of short stories do not go into audible versions. And we are so lucky here because Mark has created, um, Mark and Bronwyn have created this audible version of Little Matsue and other tales. So no, I read fiction, I read nonfiction, um, but I do remember one of the storytellers that I really admired as a young man was Angelo Lukakis, the Greek Australian writer. I thought his stuff was fabulous and it revealed to me an aspect of, of Australian life from a Greek perspective that I hadn't thought about. Yeah, yeah, now, he's, he's, he's a wonderful writer. And, yeah. he's like, and he's like you, he carries you inside worlds that, that are not necessarily so well known. I and, think so. Uh, yeah. And that, that makes the, the travelling experience with your short stories so exciting. Um, I, I, I love the diversity of stories in the collection. Um, the short story that gives the book its title, Little Batsui, has an Asian theme and setting, and so does another one, South Song Story. Yet they're in a collection published by Spineless Wonders that specialises in short Australian fiction. So are they Australian? Yes, absolutely, they're Australian. Um, firstly, we live in a multicultural society. There are Chinese Australians, Japanese Australians, Arabic Australians, Indian Australians, Vietnamese, Italians, Greeks, Germans. And that cultural diversity needs to be celebrated in all of the arts in this country. The other thing which I think makes it very much an Australian story are the themes that are in those two stories. Both of those stories are very involved with the notion of duty and obligation. And I think irrespective of the setting, irrespective of the time, those two issues in Australian society today are really paramount. When you think of the corporate world, when you come down to the nuclear family, the duty of an individual to themselves, the duty of an individual to, to the members of their family, a man to his wife or husband and wife to their children, the duty of people to their neighbours, the duty of people to the state in the biggest sense, the duty of the state to the citizenry. So Little Matsue and the telling of the South Song story are both about duty, obligation, moral obligation. This seems Little like Matsui himself actually debates that in that story. Would this be a good time to listen to Mark reading an extract from Little Matsui from that, yeah. from that story? Let's do that. That's a good Yeah, idea. let's do that. Are you hungry, Daimyo? Little Matsue shivered. Those rice cakes were for his master Yoshituro's lunch, but how could he refuse such a noble person as this? Would you like the rice cakes, Daimyo? Little Matsue whispered. The stranger nodded. Without hesitation, but with great foreboding, the boy picked up the rice cakes. I will be beaten very badly by my master for this. But the stranger is injured and hungry and has come through this terrible storm to seek shelter in the temple. Who knows what important business he is on? I cannot refuse him. What a beautiful reading. Yeah, isn't it great? It is. And there you have the dilemma. It is. Where do you get the ideas for your stories? I mean, one, one moment where with the daughter of Polish migrants producing Christmas lunch for her Australian in-laws, and the next we're travelling to the imaginary world of a child and then to a teenage boy's first sexual encounter. I mean, is it all personal experience or do you have to do a lot of research for your other stories, your Asian stories? Yes and no. It is all personal experience. Absolutely all personal experience. You can only write from personal experience. You can only create from personal experience. But I want to divide personal experience into direct personal experience, things that happened to me, like a young boy's first sexual encounter. Clearly, you know, I've had, had that. Um, the other 
prong is indirect experience. What I see out there, what I read, what I see on stage, what I hear on radio, all of that goes into this great bank and gets stored away here. Um, and that's what gets called upon when I'm writing the stories. Now, each of the ones that you've mentioned, just let me say Little Matsuri. Little Matsuri was a challenge in a writing class from a young man who said, Larry, you think you can write about anything? I said, you can. You can write about it. He said, write about rice? So of course you can. Um, and he's, he's chortled and sort of looked at, you know, rolled his eyes. I went home and wrote Little Matsue, gave it to him. He said, there you can, there's a story about rice. Goodness. Um, Christmas death is a, is a, a, a bleakish story. It, the germ of the idea comes from a memory donkeys years ago one Christmas day, one of these hot Sydney Christmas days, when I was a child, we were at home, we were all frolicking around, opening presents, talking to neighbours, talking on the phone, calling out, and I walked into the kitchen and my mother had collapsed on the floor and none of us had noticed. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I screamed and the family came and we got my mother up and to her credit, she sort of pulled herself together and did the Christmas lunch thing. Wow. So that's... Um, notion of that hot, intense Christmas kitchen with the turkey cooking and the fly buzzing around. We all know the blowflies in summer. The I just smelled the turkey when I read that. <laughs> well, the, well, I certainly smelled it when I read that. I was with Elsie. I wanted to get out from the, the smell of cooking yeah. turkey and yeah. the fly. Um, the other thing was that I taught English as a second language. And there was a stage where the Eastern Europeans were migrating to Australia. And a Polish girl came to me after one week and said, what's wrong with Australian boys? I said, what's wrong with Australian? She said, they're stupid. She'd obviously been at a party with Australia. And, of course, it's that European sophistication, even in an adolescent, and, you know, the gormlessness of a young Australian adolescence. And that's Kevin. You know, oh. this, this wonderful... A um, woman who loves him and has had three children by him and has a culture which is very different to that of Jack and Elsie, the way they why don't we Why don't we listen to a little bit more from, from Mark's uh, audio book? Um, uh, could, we have, could we have a little bit more from there, please? Yeah, was that the Aztec aspect of the progression? Yes. Well, the aspect of the progression of the Aztec queen came from my reading those South American myths and legends to my daughter when she was a child. Yeah, well, let's, let's hear that. Yeah. From the hall, a thin slit of light, forest light, deep and mysterious, seeped into the lush high valleys of the bookcase, secreted behind covers, between leaves, ancient Andean shadows stirred in the books of legends from South America. Overhead, the solar system mobile began whirling, planets and moons transforming to fiery suns, feathered gods and fierce serpents. Aztec chiefs armed themselves in preparation for battle. Massed teak drums pounded war rhythms deep into her body. Montezuma Fortescue lay perfectly still, listening as chiefs and warriors called upon their queen to rise and lead them against their enemies. Those terrible twins, rejection and fear of the dark, crept from the narrow alleys, rank canals and blood-soaked facades of ancient temples, chanting war cries and pointing at her, crouched on top of the bed mountain. The not-quite-yet queen hesitated between rising up to lead and crying herself to sleep. Wow. That's terrific, Barry. That's, that's wonderful. And, of course, Montezuma Fortescue is a little girl. Little six-year-old Felicity, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a beautiful bit of writing. Tell us a little bit about her. About Montezuma Fortescue? Yes. Um, Felicity, the, the child, who gives herself that name, um, is caught in a battle um, of marital breakdown between her parents. And she isn't getting the attention she wants. She feels rejected um, and acts out 
in this way uh, to try and get attention, acting out in the worst possible way to try and get some kind of attention from her parents. And that scene ends with this massive explosion, eruption out of the bed, the smashing of the bedside table lamp, she being cut and her mother actually coming up and cuddling her and putting her back to bed. And could we hear um, Callan the uh, opening pa paragraph from Sostenuto, which is about a teenage boy? Yep. Andrew swept the manuscript paper off the music stand with an impatient gesture and propped his head in his hands. The elegance of his long, slender fingers belied their strength and technical brilliance. Tousling thick cords of blonde hair, he took in his reflection in the window. Beyond the rain-splattered panes, the oh-so-perfect lawn rolled green, down to the rhododendrons and azaleas in full bloom of pinks, mauve and white. The end of the garden. Senses stirred deep inside him. The slate pavers led him back to that dark, hidden place. He laid his head on his arm, his eyes fixed on the tree of knowledge. That's what he calls it now. His lips brushed his arm, tonguing the light golden hairs. Warmth spread through him. The tree of knowledge. That's where she'd fucked him. Fucked. The word was so thrilling. Gosh, did I write that? <laughs> but also, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating study, this short story of a relationship between a, mo a mother and her son and the mother's desire to control his life. I and mean, you do that beautifully through this boy's first sexual experience and trying to write as well um, a piece of music. And it's, it's, it's a lovely, lovely short story. Um, so, so the selection we've just listened to shows how you, you use words to set the scene and to create the tone of your stories, because I think you're wonderful on tone. I mean, it's, it's almost like a musical tone that you have a different tone for each story. It's not the same, same, same. Um, so tell me about the writing of Sassong's story, uh, which is set in 12th century China. So we go from this teenage boy. Is that, it, is that it, Sally? Where did I get the it, idea? Yeah, where did the idea come from and what kind of research did you do for it? Okay, the idea came from um, a conference I went to in Hong Kong with five disabled actors um, it was the International Drama, Theatre and Education Conference. And we took a diversity workshop over there, which was the first contact um, workshop for people who've never had anything to do with people with disability. And of course, once you've done that workshop, there was all this free time and we had free access to any of the other programs. And I chose one given by um, a mainland Chinese academic and an English, but I think she was from Guangzhou or maybe Shanghai, I can't remember, and he was from Manchester. And she brought this old southern Chinese story about this man who was so henpecked by his wife and so browbeaten by her that his life was a total misery. And what we did in the workshop was, you know, workshop various elements of that story, deepening the meaning, um, the children in the workshop that, that was attached to the house, the, the um, condition of the man. And I was totally turned on by this workshop. I loved it. As a director, you really get people in giving you a workshop. You're always giving them a workshop. And when I walked out, there was an academic from University of Western Sydney. And I said to Marilyn, wasn't that fantastic? And she said, no. She said, it was hideous, I hated it. I said, why? She said, it was so sexist. She actually said it was sexist bullshit. Um, oh. Well, I just, you know, it totally stymied me. And that night in bed, of course, the mind began working and the story began to flip. That's and a wonderful I... description of how a story comes to be. Yeah. Callan, have we got time to listen to the garden scene from the beginning of that story? Yeah. Okay. Not grand, but it is large. I slip through the gate, 
and make my way around the side of the house. Unnoticed, I hide in a small copse of miniature maples. I can see into an elegant room that is open onto the beautiful walled garden where I am concealed. Two old people sit on polished rosewood chairs, looking out. The chairs are upholstered in finely woven bamboo, folded around frames in the geometric style. Each chair has a blue silk cushion with a pagoda and willow tree embroidered on it in red and green threads. A carved rosewood table with two curled dragon legs stands between them. The late afternoon light filters through the garden, gilding the pear trees and turning lotus flowers in the pond luminescent. Two rooks in the flame tree are feeding their chicks. The male bird takes flight and soars high over the garden wall in the direction of the marketplace in Lin An. For a moment, his shadow darkens the green glazed tiles lining the top of the wall. Then they glisten again as he flies out of sight. Their bellies full, the chicks stop chirping and settle back in the nest, their mother brooding over them, protecting them from the slanting rays of the sun. The air is heavy with the perfume of roses and plum blossom. Uh, I think that's lovely. I love that. Just try again there. That's, um, where did that come from? Many, many sources, Sally. You know the Chinese garden in Sydney at Haymarket, which I yeah. adore. I think is a real gem. When I was in China, I saw two gardens. One was called the Master of the Nets, Guard nets, the fishing nets, and the other one was the humble administrator's garden. And they were so different to Australian or European gardens, English gardens, French gardens, but exquisite in their own ways. So when I was trying to imagine that garden, a lot of those elements came in there. And then, of course, it's, a, it's an imaginary place. It doesn't exist. I made it up. But you pull into place a whole lot of elements. Now, the writing of that story, did I have to do research? Like, did I have to do research? I knew absolutely nothing about Chinese history. I knew nothing about 12th century China. So I leapt onto Google and spent days just reading through stuff and getting a sense of that period. I even listened to music of the period to get a, a sense uh -huh. of what, what might, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. That's, yeah. that's so interesting because, because it is very... Um, it's almost like a painting from that period. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you see paintings of, of, you know, the detail and the exactness of your description. Yeah. yeah. No, I love, I, I, I really love that. And, 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 and how are we going, Callum, for time? Um, probably one more question. We've got time for another question. That's terrific. Um, so this ability that you have to travel around in your stories, because there's also a story about a hip hop competition. Yes. I, I knew so little about hip hop competitions. I didn't even know properly. <laughs> and after reading that, I now am an expert. You didn't have an 18 year old son who got into hip hop because his uh, friends at school told him he couldn't dance. Not only did he get into hip hop, Nick actually opened the hip hop studio with another person. I went wow. to the. Hmm? Wow. I, sorry? That's fantastic. I went to a, a competition that he was in at the Camberwell Arts Centre in Melbourne. I skewed the average age of the audience by about 45 years. <laughs> Was quite, but they let me in and I was just totally blown away by the sounds, by the costumes, by the doof, doof, doofing of the music and by the dancing. The dancing is so beautifully choreographed, so energetic. And the other thing was that I was frightened of hip hop. I thought it was on the edge of criminality. I, don't, I think that was an American thing that somehow had filtered into my mind. But they, these kids were so nice to each other, so supportive, so caring. And I just thought this is a wonderful experience and I wanted to write that story. I'd like to, I'd like to finish with your last story, which is one of my favourites, which is Notes from the Sunroom. 
<laughs> and I suggest that anyone listening who's ever suffered from writer's block should read it. Yes, she certainly has writer's block. I don't want to give anything away, Larry. I mean, it's no. got a fabulous ending. Okay. Well, shall we leave it at that? <laughs> okay, rather than me, rather than me. The, the, the thing is that Karen misses the story. I know. She doesn't see it. I yeah. know. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, um, before yes. we move to the Q&A, yep. can I just give a plug for Spineless Wonders? You sure can. I thought they were a fantastic organisation to work with. It was so efficient. It was so problem-free. Everything flowed really, really smoothly from my sending the manuscript to getting a very quick reply, to getting the cover done and signed off, negotiating with Bettina Kaiser on the cover, to getting the book out. I just think anyone who's writing short Australian short story should consider Spineless as a, as a publisher. Yeah, their process is really streamlined is it's what I've so uh, is. Yep. seen from watching on the sidelines and Bettina does like really awesome cover art. Yep. Um, okay, so if anyone has any questions for Larry now about writing, the writing process, um, advice for emerging writers or anything about the book that intrigued you, um, feel free to fire those away in the chat and I'll read them out. So while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, so Larry, could you tell me and everyone else, I guess, if they're interested, uh, a bit more about like your teaching history? Where have you taught? Oh my gosh. Um, having done an abysmal arts degree and two, subject, two subjects hanging over, I started teaching even before you needed a degree. Um, I fell in love with it, Callum. I just fell in love with teaching kids, high school kids. Um, I then um, moved through a, a number of, um, when I did the law degree, I practiced as a, as a solicitor, got out of law, went into youth work, became a youth work trainer. So then I was training youth work workers to do their jobs, youth development officers to do their jobs. Then, um, we were pregnant with our first child. I did a dip ed and was appointed to um, the, the uh, language centre at Cleveland Street, the ILRC, the International Language and Reception Centre. And this was with newly arrived migrants. Did fabulous experience. You know, the Eastern European kids, the Russian kids, I got the Lebanese kids coming out from the Civil War. A car would backfire on Cleveland Street and that all be on the ground. Terrible, terrible stuff. Um, then I worked with Legal Aid and wrote the teaching manual for their solicitors and the community legal officers to use um, in community education. Then we moved to Melbourne. Um, and I worked in the arts down there. Yeah, I also I also spent a, a good five years at Homebush Boys High School. You got to love adolescent boys. You know, you work in a girls' school, you ask for volunteers, and a dozen hands go up. You work in a boys' school, and you ask for volunteers, and the shutters go down. And very slowly, you see them. These little eyes peeping out. Don't pick me. Don't pick me. Don't pick me. But when you win them over. Oh, it's just fantastic to work with. I got all that energy. Yep. Okay. Um, so Margaret has asked a question. Uh, what is your next book about, Larry? I suppose I should uh, preface that with: Do you have a next book coming? I do. I actually have two things. I actually have a book with three publishers and an agent at the moment. That book is the sequel to Choice Boy. It's called On Leafy Streets Unseen. I'm just waiting for some lovely publisher to pick it up and say, yes, we want to publish it. They're not rushing to do that, Gallum, I must say. Um, so if by mid-May, I've not had a response. I'll send it out to another three. I am formulating a new novel. Um, and it's about 
disavowing. It's about giving up what you have. It's about the privileged society and what value is there in having all of that privilege for its own sake. So it's at the very early stages. But I've also, this week, started writing another short story. And, of course, as soon as I started writing that short story, a second one occurred to me. So I toggled down the page, that big space between, put in a heading and made notes so I wouldn't forget what that story was about. That's, that's so, the second collection on the way. <laughs> yeah. So, Bronwyn, keep the <laughs> <top>. <laughs> Um. Okay, so one from Kate. Uh, what are your thoughts on using a female voice or that is of a cultural background that you don't share? Um, of course, it's possible to write in voices that aren't necessarily your own and you've done that well in Matsue, but how do you avoid cultural or gender appropriation or being considered to do so? Uh, is this a fine line to tread and how do you do that sensitively? Kate, it is a very fine line to tread and I have already fallen foul of it with a story which was about racism and Aboriginal people and had an Aboriginal police officer in it. Female voices, yes, up to a point, but there are a lot of fabulous female writers out there writing in female voices and the subjectivity, I think, has changed over the decades. I have female characters and they have voices. In Choice Boy, Marzella Francini, has a voice, an Italian voice, totally false voice. So in a sense, I'm not writing a female voice, even though I'm writing a female character with this, with this Italian voice. Um, it's very fraught and very difficult, but I've got Japanese and Chinese, and I can't stop writing about those. I don't, I don't know where woke fits um, for writers. You can't say to writers, this is off limits. I used to begin my writing course down in Melbourne by saying to students, nothing is sacred. And that's why this young bloke, Ben, challenged me with the thing, you think you can write about anything? I said, yes, you can. It's very difficult, Kate, very difficult. Um so another one from Andy, what story in your collection do you recommend we should read first? Or are they like in a sort of chronological order of what to read? It is funny, the sequencing is, I think you should read Little Matsue because I think Little Matsue sets the tone for all of those stories about, as we said earlier on in the conversation, duty, obligation, um, moral dilemmas. Uh, it, emotional compasses yeah um i would i would definitely start with it. it's short it's succinct and it it hits home it hits home with a big punch at the end of that story and i don't know whether people who read it expected the story to end that way yeah but definitely little matsue um so as part of my, I guess, snuggle up routine, I like to uh, lay on the couch behind me and binge read books for many hours on end. And I usually end up going through the whole thing. Is this a collection that you think we should read like one at a time, have some time to process and digest? Or um, can we just sort of absorb ourselves in it in one big stint? Oh my gosh. I mean, people read the way they read. You can do any of that. You can read one at a time and think about it. You read all of them and then think over the whole thing, go back to the ones you like. That's the beauty of a short story. You can dip in and out. You know, with a novel, if you dip in and out, you quite often lose the thread and think like, oh, okay, I've got to go back a chapter or two to, to remember what happened. But with short stories, no matter how you read them, um, each, I would hope that each one of those stories gives cause for thought and people pause enough to think about what, what's embedded in this story. Something like um, creative whiting, W-H-I-T-I-N-G. Creative whiting is a frippery. I thought the reader needed a break. Let's do something a little bit comical. Um, 
I don't think there's anything very deep and meaningful in that story, just a bit of a giggle. But the others, I think, um, there's stuff to think about. Father's Day, you know, parents, fathers say they love their children, but do they like them? You know, if they like them, when you see them on the street being really aggressive and nasty to their kids, why? Um, Bubba and the Snake, Joe thinks he's a sensitive new age guy, but he's not. <laughs> you know, he's completely unreconstructed. He resents everything. He resents the woman in the sunglasses going off to play tennis. He resents the kid in the ray bands, doof, 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 coming up. Sun. He resents Des and Rene in the supermarket. He's just full of resentments. And it's not till the end when Mary says, it's okay, I'll book Nettie into childcare centre. You can go back to work. <laughs> so there's a lot to think about here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so one from Rebecca. Hi, Larry. What was the most surprising place that you've travelled to? Surprising place. Is that the question? Yeah, surprising place or interesting place. So go with surprising place, I think. Goodness me, the most surprising place. I've... I think Siem Reap in Cambodia because... It is astonishing. The Khmer civilization was astonishing. And it was astonishing in two ways. First of all, because it was so massive and it lasted for such a long time. Secondly, because there was this constant battle between Buddhists and Hindus for control of the cities. And thirdly, because each new king built his own city. He wasn't going to have anything to do with the city that that king had built. So I just, it's just an astonishing place and it's vast, you know. We, I think we probably did a third of it. We were very lucky because my partner was in the history department at Sydney University and the archaeologists at Sydney University work in Siem Reap and we were able to go up in a helicopter and fly over the site. That was magical and very surprising, yeah. Um, another question that I wanted to ask a bit more about like the mechanics and the logistics of your writing process. I don't know if anyone sort of picked up on the, the voice narration at the start, but you um, are visually impaired. How does that like impact? Do you, do you dictate your writing or do you work with someone or? No, no. I mean, one of the irritating things about this session is as you saw at the beginning, I use a voice program called NVD, I think it's something like National Voice Disability Assist, something like that. So when I write, that voice is talking to me all the time. By the end of the day, I feel totally rattled, you know, because this voice has been talking to me. But I can't write any other way. Um, but it doesn't interfere with the creative process, which is, which is interesting and curious. The thoughts keep tumbling out of that bank that I have. Um, and I love the voice because when my typing is execrable and it looks like Polish, I can then go back and try and decipher what it was I was writing. And in doing that, uh, it's like beginning an editing process, getting it clearer. Um, but I, there's no way I can, could write with that. That's why I don't want... That's why I can't imagine um, a reader that I'm writing for. You know, I've got enough voices. I've got the voices <laughs> of the characters. I've got the voices of the narrator, um, the, the voice, the reading assist narrator. You know, a lot of voices in my head, and I'm not on medication. <laughs> uh, yeah. If the, uh, I guess, like... If you give the reading assist a name, it might be someone you could uh, write your stories for, since they're your first reader, in any case. But um, well, I suppose the short story would be when the um, the voice assist actually begins talking to you. No, no, that's not what you want to write. Don't do that to that character. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's the that's the third one in the new collection, I guess. Um, okay, so I think we've uh, run on a bit later than we planned but that's all right um so congratulations again to the three winners i will send you the redemption codes to the email address you sent to me um 
So I hope you all enjoyed spending the evening snuggled up and listening to a wonderful interview with an insightful and experienced author. So please join me in thanking Larry and Sally for their time and engaging conversation. Thank you both. Uh, Thanks, drop, Thanks I'll, everybody. So, um, I'll drop the link again. So for those who want to go check out the audiobook on Authors Direct. Um, so yeah, that one's there in the chat. Um, I'd also like to thank Spineless Wonders and their team for organizing this event and all that Spineless Wonders does to help publish emerging writers in the Australian literary industry. So in particular from Spineless Wonders, I'd like to thank Rebecca Jeans for setting up and organizing this particular event in the first place. Uh, Rebecca Graham for running the social media and keeping everyone apprised of the opportunities for some literary goodness uh, these events provide. And of course, Bronwyn Mahan, who enables these kinds of events to happen in the first place. Uh, keep an eye on the Spineless Wonders Instagram for more information on the next Snuggle Up with Spineless events, which should be smacked with Dominique Heck on the 12th of May. Um, and with all that said, stay warm, stay safe, and have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Callum. Thank you, Sally. Thank you all for coming. Bye.